We had we wrapped up Fast Kids this week for the school year as school's letting out, and we had. Uh, I'm just a, was excited about it. I know many of you will be too. We have. I taught a little bit on baptism, and we had a lot of kids interested in doing it. So we'll be getting another baptism class together if any adults would like to join in um people who expressed interest were josh brandon wyatt scarlett miles ariana savannah andy and isabella and i haven't uh i haven't talked it over with their parents yet or done the class but those were the kids that uh, raised their hands. So if you want to get in on that, if you've not yet been baptized, please let me know. Anyway, let's worship the Lord in singing this morning. Good morning. That was a good way to start off worship. Let's stand together and celebrate in song. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words. Wonderful words of life. Christ, the blessed one, gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinner, listen to the loving call. Wonderful words of life. All so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, holy Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Amen. And that's the name of our next song. Call my name. 
And now we'll pray together so you can have a moment to think about if there's something or someone you'd like to pray for. I'll open us and then if you want to pray, don't be shy about it. And then I'll close this in prayer. God, we thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you that we could be in here in your house that we could worship you, that we could pray together, and that we can open your word together. Lord, just pray that you would work in our lives, just as the Bible says, like the potter molds the clay, that you would mold us to be more holy and more Christ-like today. Just pray that we might continue to take steps of faith to be closer to you. And Lord, we just... Uh, Thank you that we could all pray together and that you hear us and that you often act on our behalf. Lord, hear our prayers as we cry out to you this morning. I'll now open the prayer time up to everybody. Thank you for hearing all of our prayers. Lord, just lift up each person that really needs a touch from you this week. Lord, those who are sick, those who are recovering from surgery, 
those that are about to go in, especially just want to lift up to you, uh, Sarah and Mike, both both having their eye surgeries, that it would go that it would go well and be effective. Lord, pray for the rest of our service that our focus be on you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up and continue in our worship. I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Tis a melody. I love the Christ who died on Calvary, for he washed my sins away. He put within my heart a melody, and I know it's there to stay. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. Glorious harmony when the courts of heaven ring. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody. Thank you. 
is fine. You are Lord, the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You are Lord, are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit A few months ago, I had a friend unexpectedly pass away, and we were, we'd grown up together playing Little League and wrestling team, and our wrestling coach was also a pastor, and 
I later came to work with him as my first time on church staff as the youth pastor of that church. But um, so we go a long ways back. And shortly before the funeral, this pastor was officiating the funeral. He says to me in a confessional sort of way, like, Ryan, I got to tell you, I don't really like doing funerals. That's funny. I said, there'd be something wrong with you if you did. <laughs> so I don't think, uh, I don't think any of us necessarily enjoy them. In fact, some people, some people avoid them for people say like, well, I don't, I don't go to funerals. I just, they're, they're sad. They're supposed to be sad. But I've found Christians can be sometimes afraid of those emotions, afraid of grief, afraid of anger, afraid of sadness. But in the Bible, we see those emotions and what we're supposed to do with them. I had a conversation recently where somebody thought sadness was a sin when it's not a sin or some people may believe anger is a sin yet you see Jesus is teaching be angry and sin not don't let the sun go down upon your wrath and Jesus we saw a few times Jesus got angry yet in his anger he didn't sin. We're coming back to the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain, depending. I know we lost, perhaps lost a little bit of momentum with it as I started going through the Beatitudes, which are really rich and really deep. And then I was out with health issues for several weeks. But now we circle back around to Luke's gospel. Luke chapter 6, verse 17, is talking about Jesus, said he went down with them and stood on a level place. In Matthew's gospel, we have many of the same words, but we have Jesus on a mountain. And so people have debated this in scholarly circles, saying, was this the same sermon? that was told slightly different ways was perhaps the level place up on a mountainside where you have a clearing and could gather a cloud a crowd or were these two separate events did Jesus preach a similar sermon more than once I've preached the same sermon sometimes. You know, if I feel that I've got a good one, that's really something on my heart. And then another church asked me to go do a retreat, which I've done. Well, will you do the same lesson? So Jesus may have gave, given the same talk to do for two different people, or it may have been the same event. Nonetheless, it's widely hailed to be the greatest sermon ever preached takes up a few chapters of the Bible. And these ones here are called the Beatitudes. Beatitudes is a word that means supreme happiness or blessedness. Anybody here want supreme blessing and happiness? Amen. Who doesn't? So Jesus is telling us these keys to a blessed life and keys to a happy life. I'd shared before, there's several books on the Beatitudes, which is just this one section of the Sermon on the Mount. I like the title of Robert Schuller's book, The Be Happy Attitudes. <laughs> Luke 6, 17, he went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea 
from Jerusalem and from the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon. So Jesus was from Nazareth, which is in Judea, from Jerusalem, kind of the other side of another part of Israel, and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, that's the Greek world there, who would come to hear him and be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because the power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours are the kingdom of God. Matthew there has, Blessed are you who are poor in spirit, meaning poor in spirit means, well, people... People nowadays tend to think the popular consensus is we're all good people. Everybody's a good person deep down, even everybody in prison. We're all, everybody's basically good where the Bible tells us we're sinners. That we're born with this depravity and only God can save us through Jesus Christ's work on the cross. So we're a poor in spirit, meaning you cannot earn your way to salvation. It's a gift of God, lest no man should boast. So we're poor in spirit, not being able to earn our way to heaven. We have to accept the gift of God. And also, Luke just saying, Blessed are you who are poor for years of the kingdom of God. Just because money's short, or your house isn't fancy, it doesn't mean the Lord's not blessing you as well. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Just because you're hungry doesn't mean God's blessing you. God's not blessing you. Matthew's version said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. There's something spiritually right about having a good appetite for righteousness and the things of God. Just like that song we sang about, as the deer panteth for the water, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, thirsting for God, being hungry for God, being hungry for righteousness. There's something spiritually wrong that we need to try to diagnose if you're feeling like, oh, I'm just not interested in church. I'm not interested in reading the Bible. I have no appetite left for prayer. There's some work to do to get you back on track spiritually. And then, blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Matthew's version, blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. And then, blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, when they, when they insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how the ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. So as we go through this, Luke has four Beatitudes. Matthew's Gospel has eight. In Luke, we have blessed are you who are poor, hungry, weeping, and hated. It's kind of confusing. Blessed are you. Well, Jesus is teaching you could be those things, but God could still be blessing you. And today we come to we come to weeping. So this is number three of Luke's Beatitudes, which are the recorded sayings of Jesus. But then we're going to shift over and finish the whole list with the four that Matthew have in addition to what Luke has. But today we have, Blessed are you who weep, for you will laugh. Or in Matthew's Gospel, 
Matthew 5 verse 1 says, Now when he saw the crowds, he went up to a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed, is those, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Are we supposed to mourn? A literal translation of this would be a paradox. Two seemingly opposite things that are nonetheless true. That's what a paradox is. Literally translated, one might say, happy are those who are sad. Happy are those who are sad. You could spend all day thinking about that. Happy are those who are sad, for they will be comforted. And as we said in the beginning of it, nobody likes grief. We're not supposed to like grief. It's sadness because something happens that you don't like. Something happens that breaks your heart or shatters your world. And while we opened it up, talking briefly about funerals and death, Grief and sadness are caused by a whole lot of different things. Grief's not just when somebody dies. Grief, is, grief can be any sort of loss you experience. People experience profound grief with the breakup and dissolution of a marriage or dating relationship. People experience grief when they lose their job, if it's something they've been in a long time and something they care about. People experience grief when a good friend moves away. People experience grief when you lose your health and have a health problem or lose a limb. Grief's experience for grief and sadness are experienced for so many different things. Blessed are those who mourn. Well, my experience, a lot of our culture, a lot of people seem to be afraid of it, and Christians are afraid of it. I don't know. I've done a lot of funerals, and in planning them, I've heard it out almost every one of them. Well, we don't want this funeral to be sad. Oh, well, why not? Well, because they're in a better place with Jesus, so we're just going to be happy. Well, yes, there's true, but we've been, we've been left behind in a sense. It's sad. It's a funeral. We're grieving. You're missing the point. Well, can we not just, can we not call it a funeral? Can we call it a celebration of life? We don't want anybody crying. We just want this to be a happy remembrance. Well, in a sense, there's nothing wrong with that. Except if there's no tears and nobody cries and it's just all happy and everybody around you is just saying, basically turn that frown upside down. It's, it's not very helpful. God gave us emotions to experience them, but in experiencing them, like perhaps anger, we were talking about anger. You can be angry. In fact, a lot of things you should be angry about. There's a lot of injustice out there in the world, and there's a lot of things wrong with this world. I mean, how do you read about a school shooting that we see more and more frequently and not feel some righteous anger? Or how do we see oppression around us and social injustice and not feel angry about it. We should and how when when we lose something we're supposed to be sad. It's our way of processing it and dealing with it. I remember being a kid when a few times we were assigned to memorize scripture. Sometimes the Sunday school teacher might tell us to memorize a verse this week. And so naturally, the kids would want to know, well, what's the shortest verse in the Bible? Amen. You know what? We, 
We memorized a whole lot of verses just to like get that gummy worm or the cinnamon bear afterwards. And if you forgot to memorize your verse, I mean, it was really sad when everybody else gets the gummy worm and you don't or the licorice or whatever it was they had. But well, what's the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. <laughs> Jesus wept. And by example, we see even Jesus was sad. Now, why did Jesus weep? Well, because he had news that his good friend Lazarus had died. And he was very sad about that. So, with that, you see, God gave us our emotions. And... We ask the question, can you really have happiness without sadness? If we didn't have those emotions and there was no sadness, it seems to, be, to me to be pretty impossible to just be happy all the time. Now, the Bible tells us that we can have joy in all things, and joy in all circumstances. But that's the paradox here. That grief and sadness, along with joy, can happen at the same time. A funeral can be a celebration of life at the same time. It can be both happy and sad. Or other things. We can develop health problems or even get older where we can't do the things that we used to. We have to give up certain hobbies or delegate certain tasks that we used to do and be sad about it, yet at the same time we can have joy in the Lord. Happiness and sadness can go together and coexist. Another thing when we're sad, though they contradict, these things seem contradictory, but can coexist. Another thing it says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. A lot of the time, it's when things are not going right. When God draws near to us and comforts us, and we experience his presence. And I've seen this again and again. You probably have too. Things are going great for somebody. They're being blessed. Life is good. And when life is really good, it's really easy to just forget all about God because when you already have everything you need and things are going right all the time, it can be very easy to think that you will, I have no need for God. But guess what? When crisis comes, what do you do? You take a step back and say, oh my gosh, everything's falling apart here. I've lost control. What can I do about this? Who can help me? Oh, God. Yeah, God, God can help me. Even though I don't know how many people I know that have turned to God in the midst of crisis. It's one of those things again and again, especially with evangelism and sharing your faith. A lot of the time when people are telling you that things are going really bad in their life and they're afraid... Well, that's when things become clear and you could see your need for God. A lot of people have seen their need for God and salvation for the first time when things are falling apart, when things aren't going so well, that you could be mourning, you could be sad, and in the midst of that, you feel God's comfort and he draws near to you when we're sad, when we call upon him. How many funerals too have we have I heard like, man, I I don't know how I I don't know how I could have got through this had it not been for the Lord drawing near to me and comforting me and coming alongside of me. It's like that song we sing, It is well with my soul. You know the story of that? The songwriter there had just lost his family when their ship sank as he had gone ahead of them and they were supposed to arrive and 
he uh, wrote those words that morning as he was processing it about how the Lord was comforting him through it. So, with, with sadness, the other thing we have to be careful of is not getting stuck in it. Not getting stuck in it for years. Tradition in Jewish culture, they would, when somebody would die, there would be a mourning period where they would go around in sackcloth and ashes. I have a hard time picturing what that looks like. Thinking you put some black on your face and wear a burlap sack around. Or like they did in our country a hundred years ago, where you'd wear black for a month. Go around in your black outfit. Now, I had a class in college called Psychology of Grief and Death. And one of the things that we learned is that when people don't mourn, and a lot of people do this, when somebody says, well, I'm just, I just don't want to ruin my happiness. I'm not going to shed a tear. I'm not going to be sad. I'm just going to turn my frown upside down. An interesting thing happens with that. They get stuck. They get stuck. I mean, it's it's like they'll still be having a really hard time with it and fighting the urge to mourn for, you know, the next year, two years, three years. And you know, you know what happens with that? The when they finally, I mean, if it if it comes a year later, when they finally break down and have a good cry about it, and process it and work through those feelings, then that's when healing starts to come. That's when healing starts to come. So just avoiding grief and sadness seems to do more harm than good. And in the Bible here, you know, we have uh, Jesus gives us permission and encouragement to do it, to work through our sadness. Well, with our sadness, we often feel like it's going to flood in and overwhelm us, and we won't be able to handle it. But here we have, blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. What's that mean? That God's, God's saying that we don't have to do that alone. He's going to walk with us. He's going to comfort us. He's going to draw near to us in that time. And it's not just a one-time thing either. It's not just that, okay, I'm going to sit down and have a good cry, and then it's over. They say time heals all things. And it, it always doesn't, but helps us to come to a place of acceptance. There's a popular book that popular among psychologists and therapists and hospice workers that uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote, who was a psychiatrist that had done a lot of hospice type of work with dying and mourning. She wrote 23 books about mourning and the process of dying. And I read one of those in that psychology of grief and death class and she wrote about what's popularly called the five stages of grief and death people go through these when they're dying if they don't if you know if they have a longer death not not a sudden death when you don't have time to process it but people go through them that are dealing with loss not just death, but any type of loss in our lives. Even life change types of things. And one of the interesting things with the stages that she wrote are they're not, they're not linear. You don't go through them in order. You kind of work through them, often in this order, but then maybe you're on step four, and all of a sudden you go back to step one the next day, or later this afternoon. Step one's denial, 
sometimes with isolation. This isn't really happening to me. Like, this isn't real. Step two, anger. Why is this happening to me? And I'm angry about it. I'm angry about things. Hmm. Bargaining. Like, I promise I'll be a better person if, or trying to negotiate with God to bring back what he lost. A do-over. Depression. Meaning that's when the sadness overtakes you and might feel like I don't care anymore. And then last of those things are acceptance. I'm ready for whatever comes. And these, as I said, apply whatever type of loss that we're going through. God, though, wants good things for us. We have to trust him in those hard situations. It works in a mysterious way. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. One other thing while we're on the topic, blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. What about depression? Sometimes after something like this, you can get stuck in a depression. A longer term sadness that you can't control. And one of the most misunderstood things about depression is that you could just decide to snap out of it. Quit being so sad and get over yourself and snap out of it doesn't work that way. It can become a sickness. People can't come out of a depression as easily if you said like, well, you have strep throat. You just decide it doesn't hurt anymore and get over it. Right? Just, just forget about it and move on with your life. You know, just uh, get, get back to work. Like, well, I have a fever. Well, just decide you don't have one anymore. When you have depression, there are chemicals in your brain, foremost serotonin, that your body is in short supply of. And you need to get help. If you're in a depression where you can't get out of bed, medically you need to get help, just like if you need to go get an antibiotic. And I've heard pastors say, depressions, I've heard some people claim that depression's sinful and you just need to look to the Lord. Yes, the Lord will comfort you, but no, it's not a sin. And yes, you need help. And it's nothing to be ashamed of. Let's just get that, get that out there and clear. And if somebody's in a depression or even at the beginning stages of grief, sometimes the platitudes don't help of, well, quit crying because you know they're in heaven with Jesus. Guess what? You're not crying for them. You're crying for yourself and your own loss. Crying for yourself and your own loss when that happens. I like how the Message Bible put it in Matthews. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one who is most dear to you. So true. Leaning on God's promises during these times. Hebrews 13, 5. I will never leave you or forsake you. And isn't it interesting today, as we come to the end of it, we're talking about eight things Jesus gave us for supreme blessedness and supreme happiness. 
So interesting that one of the ones he gives us to have supreme blessedness and happiness is sadness or mourning. Spend some time thinking about that. It's, it's pretty deep here, pretty profound thing that our happiness is restored when we experience sadness. It's good to mourn. God's right there with us to comfort us, bring, it, bring us through it, and bring healing to our lives. Let's continue to worship God through music. And as we do, I'll be up here if anybody wants to come forward and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior or for prayer for any other things. Amen. Let's stand together. So I got a call earlier this week that Betty had accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior Amen. and that she wanted to come forward this Sunday for prayer as God's been at work in her life and John was with her when she accepted Christ and you want to tell us a little bit about that John and Betty? Uh. <laughs> Kind of got me on a spot here. <laughs> uh, it's not about me. It's about God. It's about Betty and God. And it's a personal relationship, as we all know, that we all have. And I'm just uh, so grateful to the Lord Jesus Christ for just using me as a servant. And uh, just because um, I pray all the time, that he'll guide me in that direction. And... <clears throat> So I'm, uh, Betty and I have been friends for a couple of years since I lost my wife and she lost her husband and we've just been really, really, truly good friends supporting one another all the way through our grief and um, watching old movies and uh, things like that, you know, I'm having popcorn and uh, not dating any, any movie beyond 1947, I think. <laughs> <laughs> And not in color either, so. <laughs> <laughs> they're fun. Anyway, they're fun. anyway, I'm so proud of Betty and I'm so grateful to the Lord Jesus for letting me be her friend. And it's amazing how he uh, controls our life when we ask him to. And when, when we send a surrender our life to him and say, just do with me as you will. Amen. He does. <laughs> well you. let's let's pray let's pray for you as we all Extend a welcome to the family of faith. Thank you so much. Lord, we just thank you for how you've been at work in Betty's life. Lord, thank you for loving her. We thank you that her all of her sins are forgiven, just as all of ours are. Thank you that she's accepted you as her Lord and Savior. And just pray for her that she continue to grow in Christ. 
as she continues to learn your word and walk with you. Just pray that you would draw near to her, fill her with your love, fill her with the Holy Spirit. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name as we're all excited about it. Amen. All right, announcements. You can be seated. Um, whether you're a visitor or here all the time, invite you to fill out a Connect card in the back of the chair in front of you. If you're here all the time, you could use it to put a prayer request if you have one to know that you'll be prayed for. Or if you're a visitor, so that we have your contact information. Also remember, you can still give online by bank bill pay or by mail if you wish. Um, you've heard that we need more volunteers to work with children. We have a critical need for people to sign up to help Michael Brown and Children's Chapel for the next two Sundays because Joyce won't be here to do it. So please sign up on the back table if you're willing to do that. We, we have a policy at church with working with kids to have two adults at all times, as even, be, even though churches are the house of God, or at least they're supposed to be, a lot of people have been really harmed spiritually and physically by one bad apple in churches. So it's important that we maintain that if you're willing to do that. Um, also, Vacation Bible School is coming up in just over a week. Please take some uh, Vacation Bible School invite cards with registration on the back and share them with family, neighbors, or any kids that you think would um, like to come. So it's June 12th through 15th. And one, uh, one side note in that, I'm just still trying to track down and make sure the food's getting handled as we're uh, um, providing lunch. So if you're on that team, I'd just like to check in with you afterward today. As usual, check the announcements in the bulletin, on the screen, and on our website for upcoming events. And now, I'm going to do the benediction to dismiss, but if you're a member here, I'd just like to ask you to stick around to have a special meeting for probably five or ten minutes as we need to change just a wording in our constitution so we could continue to get the property tax exemption here. Um, so if you're not a member or not involved with that, you are welcome to stick around, but also free to be dismissed and the rest of us will be just a few minutes behind you. So why don't I have everybody stay seated for the benediction today? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Dolores said uh, lunch at Red Robin if anybody would like to join. Just celebrate all the June birthdays. All the June birthdays, all right. Mm -hmm. Such a good restaurant. <laughs> um, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.